This presentation will address reducing cognitive load for online teaching. So what is cognitive load? Some of the main goals of teaching and learning include getting your course content into students' long-term memory and encouraging them to think deeply about the content and processes in that course. So any new content or learning to think differently and make connections between information requires that stimuli go through working memory, and working memory is very limited. So cognitive load involves two parts. One is the intrinsic load of the material that is imposed by the structure of the content. So learning chemistry or English or foreign language or art, all of those require a lot of cognitive resources, and that cannot be changed. However, the other aspect of cognitive load is the extrinsic load and that is imposed by the manner of instruction. And this is what we can control. We can change our instruction practices and our design so that students can make the most of the cognitive resources that they have. So here are some tips for asynchronous learning. And I put the word asynchronous here because I imagine that more of these are relevant to things that you record and tutorials and web pages that you want students to read, as opposed to live Zoom or Microsoft Team classes where it's much harder to implement these. The first thing to consider is how you balance audio versus text. So you could give a lecture that is entirely audio, or you could simply give students something to read. And each of these have advantages and disadvantages. There are many experts who say that we are biologically designed to understand information and to share information through audio inputs. So that includes speaking and listening. They argue that we can see this very clearly as we consider how children learn to understand and to speak much earlier and with much less direct instruction than reading and writing. But it's also important to recognize that it's transient. So what I said 30 seconds ago is already in the past and you're concentrating on what I'm saying now and that can make it difficult for the learners to process and consider the information carefully, particularly if it is something that they're struggling with. In contrast, reading and writing are biologically secondary. It requires a lot of direct instruction over a long period of time for students to learn how to do this, but it has the advantage of being more permanent. This is not to say that you only have to use one or the other. For example, I am speaking to you now and I have given you the highlights of this on this slide, and that means that you are encoding the information through both your eyes and your ears, and that can be very effective. But you have to consider the balance of text and audio and how they relate to each other in order to make the most effective recordings as possible. Most of us have probably heard the advice when we prepare for conferences or sometimes for class that we should not put too much text on a PowerPoint slide. And that can be overwhelming for people viewing and listening to your lecture. Your audience is likely to tune your voice out and read or look away from the screen. And you don't want either of those. So you want to make sure that the text that you present is manageable and does not conflict with the information they're getting through your voice. This is a rose. This is also an example of redundancy. Redundancy is giving the same information through multiple modes. So, for example, when I told you that this is a rose, that was audio information. You also have an image that is easily recognizable as a rose, in addition to the word rose. So I gave you that information in three different modalities. Sometimes this is really important. This can be a key way to emphasize what you really want students to remember. But if you do this too often, students may tune you out or it may overwhelm them. So you want to use redundancy with caution and discernment. Let me tell you about the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. 
hopefully you recognize that your brain is trying to make sense out of why I'm telling you the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, which you're familiar with, and you know takes place in a forest with this image. Sometimes educators can be tempted to put in images into slides that have nothing to do with the content, and students waste precious working memory and precious attention trying to figure out what the connection is between those. So make sure that your visuals line up with the content that you are trying to portray to students as opposed to conflicting with it. Text and pictures should go hand in hand, and along with that, so should audio. Make sure that the different modalities you use to present information do not conflict with each other, rather they walk hand in hand and complement each other. The next tip is chunking, and chunking can mean a number of things. Primarily it means breaking up content into manageable pieces. So this means taking a complicated topic, breaking it down into smaller pieces, and then organizing it well so students feel like the information is presented in an organized manner. This also means that if you can break up a long lecture into smaller pieces, that may be better for students. So students need practice doing the things that you teach. Practice can be a lot of different things. Practice can be answering some comprehension questions as they watch a lecture. It can be many different things. Students don't learn well if they are only watching lectures and videos without having to actually do anything. So try to intersperse opportunities to practice materials in various ways to get students to be active and engaged in what they are learning. The next tip is about the principle of contiguity. In the context of psychology, the definition of contiguity is the sequential occurrence or proximity of stimulus and response causing their association in the mind. So information that is related to each other, such as directions and an activity or a tutorial and the related quiz questions, should be on the same screen. You should be very wary of creating educational materials where students are supposed to understand the directions in one place and do something in another place. So do your best to make sure that information that relates to each other is all in one space for students. Next is links. Hyperlinks are great. However, they can overwhelm students' ability to focus on information. So the things that you want them to do should happen one after another. Otherwise, students may look at a tutorial that includes links to additional information, and if there are multiple links to additional information, then students' attention will be directed in multiple ways, and because it can only go in one at a time, but it will feel that it's supposed to go in more than one at a time, that can cause a lot of problems. So if a tutorial had links to three different things, and each of those sent them in yet more directions, then very quickly students will be overwhelmed. So keep this in mind that students' attention is limited and can only focus on one thing at a time. And if you have sequential pages, be sure that there is only one link at the bottom of each page to take them to the next one, as opposed to saying, if you want to learn more about this, go here. If you want to learn more about this, go here you will be very likely to lose them. And finally, consider the level of learning and what those students are likely to need. So novice learners may need more guidance and help than experienced learners. You already do this in the classroom, but think about how this changes as you move to an online system. For example, if you are asking them to use a new technology, and it's something that they aren't expected to be familiar with or have experienced anything similar to, you probably want to spend some time just practicing using that technology as opposed to learning and using that new technology at the same time. For more advanced learners, even if there's a new technology, if they've seen something similar, you might not have to spend that time on it. 
So consider how the material you are presenting lines up with the level of learners you are presenting it to. And the last tip is consider the amount of control you give to students. Advanced learners may want and need more control over the pace of the, the materials that you create than novice learners. So for example, do your videos allow students to pause and skip ahead or go back? Or is there a reason for you to not want them to do that? So for example, if there is a quiz at the end of a tutorial, you may not want students to be able to skip ahead. However, you may want to add several places where the tutorial pauses so that students could take a break or possibly allow them to go back and listen to something again if they didn't understand or they need to hear it a second time. So in conclusion, here is my name and contact information. I have very little experience teaching online. However, I have been reading about cognitive psychology for quite a while and I do make tutorials for the library. So if you have any questions or you would like to talk to somebody about how you are designing any kind of asynchronous materials or any kind of materials that incorporate any of these tips for reducing cognitive load, I would be happy to talk those out with you or to look at some of them and give you feedback if you believe that will be helpful. Thank you very much for watching this presentation.